I don't know how sorry you're going to be you came in here. Uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a bit of a session anyway. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the first talk of the day. Uh, my name's Richard Ashton, uh, and it's a great honour as a big fan of Jerry Anderson's work and the future that he's created in so many films such as Thunderbirds, Joe 90, Captain Scarlet, UFO, Space 1999 onwards, to have a very fantastic actor who played one of the most iconic characters in Anderson series, who was called? Uh, Tracy. Yeah. And him, the actor's name, you all as well know, is Shane Rimmer. Okay. So Shane, I mean, yeah. we talked yesterday at length, we had a good old yeah, chat. we did. And did any, was anybody ever uh, to the chat yesterday? No, so we, I no, think I we've got to start in the street. <laughs> we'll, we'll start from the top then. So basically, I think yeah. the first question I fired at you was, how did you start in acting? Because obviously, you've done, with the voice work you did for Scott, yeah. you, we talked about you've done stage work, and then you was in films alongside Roger Moore and Sean Connery in the Bond films. Uh -huh. So there's a lot there to go through. So do you want to, do you want to start from the top? Yeah, well, I, I, I born in Toronto, Canada, um, which is a marvelous country. I mean, the, uh, the natural sort of part of it, the woods and the rivers, it really is a place of beauty. But uh, the one thing they didn't have was any access to uh, films or uh, any kind of entertainment uh, facility at all. So, uh, as, as much as you can appreciate uh, paddling along on some of the great rivers in Canada and uh, getting up into the woods and seeing bear and wolves and God knows what, uh, you still have to make a living. And uh, I had a trio, a singing trio, and uh, we uh, were in and out of universities and colleges and this sort of thing. But we really hadn't hit the main uh, the main line yet. So we decided to come to England, which has quite a, quite a history of uh, entertainment and theaters and clubs and God knows what, and radio and television. All of which Canada was just uh, starting to get into. Uh, so we landed at Southampton and uh, got ourselves an agent in about a week's time, which was very, very lucky, and uh, started in on variety theaters. So we, we had, the, of course, the trio was still with me, so we had a singing act called The Three Juices, and we toured around uh, at number three, just that's where you start off when you don't know too much about what you're doing. Uh, it was lovely, it's a great way to see the country. Uh, and we visited a, a lot of places that way we otherwise would have missed. And uh, we graduated to number two, and then we got on to the Moss Empires, which was the premier sort of run of uh, variety theaters. And some of the best comics in the country, this is where they earned their living, and they were tremendous. And we used to go into the wings and just have a look out on stage and see how these, uh, these veterans uh, handled crowds. And it was always a, something that you could feel a little bit shaken by when you walk out on stage and there's a full theater waiting for you to say something or be entertained. Anyway, it, was, uh, it worked out okay. Um, I was with the act for two years and then uh, I was picked up by uh, the, the director of, um, what was it, St um, <coughs> Stanley Kubrick, sorry, Stanley Kubrick, who, who uh, directed Dr. Strangelove with uh, Peter Sellers and a uh, cast of great English actors. So that was my beginning and uh, uh, it was uh, 
a great way to start because it became one of the, the big pictures of the, of the century. And he was an amazing man, old Stanley Kubrick. Um, he got, and he was, he was sort of a, a, a guy who listened to problems from anybody who wanted to present them to him and really did a marvelous job in keeping people together. Casts can fall apart very easily, especially if there's any jealousy or kind of backstabbing going on. And you know, more pictures have been ruined just by a, a kind of a relationship like that and then he would think possible. Anyway, there it was uh, with Dr. Strangelow. Uh, Peter Sellers, by the way, uh, a magnificent actor, uh, was having problems uh, and having to uh, uh, travel back to Switzerland every weekend to have a session with the psychiatrist. He wasn't, uh, it, it was just, uh, well, nobody really figured out what it was, um, but he was very unpredictable. When he was on, when he was good, when he was doing voices, which he loved doing, he was magnificent. Nobody could beat him. Um, when that sort of slowed down a bit, he got very concerned and very worried and didn't know what on earth his next move was going to be. So, he and, he and Stanley Cooper had a bus stop, unfortunately. They had a terrible argument on the in, inside the plane. We were all cooped up in this uh, B-29 bomber, which was strung out from the, from the top of uh, Shepperton Studio. Stanley Kubrick was down on the floor looking up uh, and trying to pacify Peter Sellers who wouldn't be pacified and, they, and the argument continued. Sellers got so angry he rushed to the front of the plane forgetting that it had been cut off to allow the camera crew access to the uh, flight deck uh, and he went down 10 feet, crash on the cement floor. Uh, and that's why you saw Peter Sellers in a wheelchair for most of that picture. He gets he broke a leg, and uh, he can't, can't perform too well with a broken leg on you. Anyway, there it was. But then, um, moving forward in your career, you ended up meeting Jerry Anderson, and the Scott Tracy was born. Oh, yes, he heard uh, the BBC did a series called Contract. Uh, in which I played an American editor. Uh, Jerry happened to hear it and thought the voice that he heard from me would be good for Scott Tracy. Who we, they were just starting to organize Thunderbird. Uh, this is the way Jerry worked. He was a very fortunate sort of fellow. He, uh, first of all, he knew the business backwards. He had been, he had been a top flight uh, uh, man to, to uh, cut pictures, uh, but uh, just a minute now, wait a minute, oh yeah, I got it. So uh, he uh, got in touch with me and said I'd like you to come down and um, do a couple of lines just to hear that voice and see how, how you handle yourself. Well, what are you going to do, Jerry Anderson? But, so I did. I went to uh, Gerard's Cross, which he had a beautiful big house. Things had been happening in a big way for Jerry. Put down some lines. Two weeks later, I got a call saying, you are now otherwise known as Scott Tracy, which was true. Uh, you just had a feeling that things might be going pretty well, and they did. Um, it took a little while to get people to fasten on to puppets, but the scripts were so good, the actors' voices who were on the uh, production were so terrific that people just couldn't resist the program. Fantastic. And uh, it started to go all over the world, and uh, it became a big international hit. Fantastic. I mean, when you 
What was your thoughts when you actually first saw Scott Tracy, the puppet version of you? Would you think, boy, that doesn't look like me at all? I, I didn't mind. I thought he looked better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you, sort of, you sort of live a dual kind of life for a while uh, because you become identified with Scott Tracy simply because of the uh, series was so popular, uh, and he became, uh, you know, well, your, your man next door. And it, it was all terrific stuff. They had, uh, they had uh, actors coming in from all over the place who all of a sudden wanted to, wanted to be in the cast of uh, Thunderbirds. And so he had, a, he had a guest list that really was quite amazing. And that uh, only made things prosper for, uh, for uh, Thunderbirds. And then uh, I got into, into other films. Uh, the Bond the, the, the Brigade. Uh, they start you off rather slowly, so I did You Only Live Twice uh, and Diamonds Are Forever, the first two. Yeah, yeah. And I just sort of walk on, didn't do very much. But then I got the spy who loved me as the uh, commander of the submarine, the biggest submarine I ever saw in my life. It was fantastic. Somebody didn't get paid, I think, and they set fire to it. I look at it. Set fire to the submarine. And uh, they had to build it again. Now, otherwise, in that little uh, side issue, uh, things went quite well. I mean, you started on stage. You yeah. went. You went back to doing films. Yeah. Which is a completely different medium. Yeah. Then you did voice work. I mean, how did they actually record the voices for Thunderbirds? Did you have individual booths, or were you all together? Uh, well, uh, what would happen in an ordinary circumstance would be that you would have uh, separate mics or separate actors, and then. Uh, but Jerry didn't want to do that. He said, in, your, in, a, in this sort of situation where you're a group of guys who work together all the time, uh, there's got to be one central mic. So we got a, a, a mic that just went, you know, what they call universal mic, and it just had to do with multi-directional and all this. And he hung it from the ceiling, very powerful. And so we had to go in uh, and form up and get close to the microphone so we could get picked up. And we had some kind of collisions around there, you would have been see. And because you, you couldn't miss your cue, you had to get to that back spot and get somebody else out of the way so you could, you could uh, be close enough to the, to the microphone. So it was a bit erratic at times. You never knew whether you were going to come out of there with a bandage eye or what. But, like I say, Thunderbirds, iconic, and then you came back to do Thunderbirds movies. Yeah. Which you thought, we've done it on the telly, but well, now we're making movies out of with puppets. Yeah. It's amazing that the, uh, the reach that uh, Thunderbirds had. I think it was the first time puppets had been a, a major source of, source of film. But uh, it, 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 it was a great popularity attached to Thunderbirds, and people became very uh, uh, enamored with them. Uh, we, they had good scripts, but, but I know Tony Barwick, who had been in, uh, in America doing scripts, uh, and got tired of the States, and came back to London, uh, was the chief script editor, and he was exceedingly good, especially in action stuff. So, uh, everything was taken care of. Derek Meadows was the special effects man, and there couldn't have been a better, a better one ever. He graduated to Bond pictures after a while. And uh, so, the, uh, the, the people who were in charge of various uh, departments in, in, the, uh, in the series were, were number one. There's no doubt about it. Not only that, but they could pass on, and did in a very generous way, uh, all that they knew. 
because kids were coming into uh, the Anderson regime, you know, at 17 and 18, and um, with very little uh, uh, knowledge of what actually they were supposed to do. Uh, but uh, Jerry Meddings and, and he had a couple of good assistants, told them, cheered them on so that they, uh, they were, became more comfortable all the time with, with the part that they had. They kept on working that way. And now was the school and more and more and more to, to, to yeah. lift them up. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I looked through the list of films that you've done, and just to name a few, because it's a big list. It's a big, big list. I mean, like you were saying with the Bond films, You Only Live Twice, Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die. I mean, we talk Rollerball. Yeah. Yeah, Rollerball. You, you, you enjoyed it, Rob, Beyond Rollerball. Oh, I loved it. We did it out in Munich. And uh, uh, James, what's his name? Yeah. Uh, uh, he, 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 he was the, uh, the main actor. It's about roller skating, playing hockey, uh, ice hockey. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty level sport because they had uh, quite a few characters who were taken off the rink, off the uh, track, and taken to the hospital because of the, uh, the impact. They were going at, at a minimum of 40 miles an hour and sometimes more. So when you had got hit by somebody coming at you on roller skates at 40 miles an hour, you felt it. And you really probably had to take a couple of weeks out uh, to try to mend yourself. I mean, current situation with films now, everybody's into superheroes. And you appeared in every one of the original Superman films. Oh yeah, that's right. S Superman 1, Superman 2, Superman 3. This is before yeah. Marvel Universe, Cinematic Universe was the big thing. Superman was the big thing. Well, it was, it was. He was good. He died much too, too early. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he created that, that, that role, there's no doubt about it. And he was tremendous in it. Uh, he was a, a lovely fellow. And it was a, just a terrible sort of accident when he went off his horse and broke his back and just never recovered. Um, and he had about two years left where he stayed alive, but it wasn't much of a life. He was bound to that, uh, to that injury for as, as long as he lived. I mean, also, on films were looking down the list, Gandhi. Was Gandhi was there. lovely, yeah. Gandhi was lovely. Uh, I can understand why people get very attached to India and the uh, sort of philosophy that goes with that attachment. It's just a rather beautiful way of life. They're amazing. They have, of course, the other way of life, which can be uh, a bit dynamic and a bit injurious to others. But, uh, the, base, the basis of Indian life was remarkably that's the word. Remarkably right. Right. Yeah. And I say out of Africa, there was a man. <laughs> yeah, Robert Redford and Merle Street. Yeah. The, uh, where we did the actual shooting was in the, uh, the wife of uh, Joe Moe uh, She was a gun runner. She, she traded in, in, uh, in uh, the worst, worst kind of armor you could have, and uh, firing that uh, you, you could imagine. It brought in a lot of guns, a lot of armor, a lot of, a lot of ammunition. And, uh, and she was, you know, the wife of Kenyatta. And uh, he was still prime minister, and this was going on. Yeah. Funny place. But like I say, the list just continues on. But it's like, you just seem to be in the right place at the right time for the, the best films ever. It was amazing, because before, before that shift took place, uh, the films coming out of London and, and England uh, were fairly local. 
or, or else they were borrowed from uh, stage, you know, a stage classic uh, film. Uh, but uh, after I'd been there for a little while, they started to go international, and they became a huge sort of international film developer. And uh, their films went all around the world. Good films. They developed very good acting as well. I mean, I've, I've just looked at some recent films that you've done, like, say, All Identity. All Identity, there you go. And you was also in Batman Begins. Yeah. Yeah. My, just, my just son was a, going. Yeah, my son was a location manager on that, on that film, and he got, he got me the job. And, uh, uh, the director is a terrific fellow, he said. So, yes, it, it, it was that situation where you were in the right spot at the right time and things were happening. Yeah. And uh, that was it. I can remember you did the pilot, because you went back to Anderson, you did the pilot for Space Police, <laughs> which became Space Precinct. Yeah. Yeah, they had uh, people wandering around and all sorts of outfits, mostly animal ones. I don't know if they ever got out of that or not. But, yeah, it, uh, I think it had a one one, one series run. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it caught on. Certainly not as well as Thunderbirds. Uh. Yeah. Well, we've had a good chat. I mean, does anybody else want to throw a question to Shane? Uh, Couldn't get the mic out and uh, sort that out. <laughs> but no, I, I think. Today, uh, I think it was yesterday, so actually, somebody came to, came to you to get an autograph who actually had your hat from Space Police. So, yeah, he's a friend of mine, he actually came and put it to sign. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, the, the question, put your hand up if you've got a question. Yeah. Shane, uh, people might not be aware that you actually starred alongside the first Doctor, William Hartnell. In fact, both you and David Graham did in uh, 1966 in The oh, Good yeah. Fighters. What, what's your memory of uh, being in Doctor Who in the 60s? Well, I couldn't believe it. Uh, uh, one of the biggest states in America, the shooter, David. And here we were doing this film you know, in a television studio. It's about the size of this where we are right now. It was a major film with horses, donkeys, we keep sheep. I don't know how they kept them all in the place. But uh, David was a bartender, and myself was a character called Seth Harper, who was sort of a, a wandering gunman. Shooting down everybody he bumped into. Uh, but uh, William Hartnell was uh, a joy to work with. He didn't like me at first. He thought I was American. And he didn't like Americans, really. I finally straightened him up and said, look, I'm, I'm from North, uh, North of America. He said, what do you mean? I thought I'm Canadian. So that settled it. We shook hands and we were quite firm buddies for the rest of the, the, rest of the run. Another question, please. Anybody else got? Hello, Mr. Rimmer. Uh, you spoke about infighting or catfighting in studios is fairly normal. And was there anything like that in the Thunderbirds studios? Well, that was an exception. Uh, I think because everybody enjoyed the series, doing it, whatever characters they played, so much that uh, nobody carried around any kind of. Uh, What's the word? Ranker. That's a good word, ranker, isn't it? Uh, so it, it really was a, 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 a flavorful type to have, type series to have, and it was successful. Uh, if you're in a picture or a film or whatever uh, that's not successful, it can be a bit harrowing. People try too hard to make it work. And that, that's about the worst thing you can do. You just got to try to relax and that big take its, take its own hand. But it, it was a, a, a happy 
a happy uh, situation. Any more questions? Uh, so, uh, I've got a good question. <laughs> what, was your, what was your initial reaction when you saw Thunderbirds the final, as, it, as it came out, as in the final product? What do you think of Thunderbirds when you actually saw it on the big screen for the first time? Yes, it's an altogether different view of a series uh, from working on it and being a part of it and then seeing it on this huge screen. Uh, I, I must say I was terribly impressed with it. Most of all with the hardware, with the, with the flight aircraft and all this sort of thing. I mean, the whole thing was so realistic. It, it, it was quite amazing. Uh, the scripts were good. They were dynamic. And uh, that's what I say, things were working so well, nobody got, uh, got the needle about anybody else. And so uh, it had a free passage. Great. I mean, you and Jerry must have had a report, a really good report, because I, I remember you actually being in UFO, you were in the pilot. Yeah. You were flying, again, as you should be, because you're the best pilot. Yeah. yeah. He was in the pilot of, well, first episode of Space 1999, flying Koenig to oh, Space yeah. A pilot again, yeah. which I, when I was younger, I remember hearing that, going, hang on a second, that's Scott Tracy. Scott Tracy's flying an eagle. <laughs> he gets around, doesn't he? But, brilliant, totally brilliant. Oh, one more. One more? Do you want to, let me see. So you were, you were piloting UFO, one of the episodes? Yes, yeah, you played an alien, yeah. Did you, did you get on well with uh, Ed Bishop, co-star? So did you get on well with Ed Bishop? For a long time, I mean, out, out, outside of UFO. Uh, for a while, uh, you know, 20 years before that, uh, Ed and I are about the only two Americans actors who were quite active. That was because of the difficulty for anybody from anywhere else uh, getting into this, into England to actually get a work permit. It wasn't, wasn't possible. So we had a lot of, lot of things to do. I toured, uh, uh, now what was the, uh, I can't remember the name but now, but it was a, an American sort of classic written written by Arthur Miller. Uh, huh? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, I, I toured with, uh, with Ed for about six months with that on stage. It was great getting back on stage again. Uh, all the falderall of films uh, was swept away and you really got down the business and acted and it was, it was a joy. It was a joy. If you could choose, we'll, 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 with closing, we'll do some closing. If you had a choice to go on stage, to do voice work or do film, which is which, which would you prefer? <laughs> oh, you're wicked. Um, I know well, it's very difficult to make it to, to make a choice because each one has a different uh, function. Um, probably the, the better uh, properties are on stage. I mean, they, they have a, a, a collection of writers who are non pariah or they're just amazing. Films can knock you out. I mean, where, where, where they stand now and, and what they can do uh, on a film floor is absolutely, absolutely amazing. So I think it's, it's, I couldn't anyway uh, point out any, uh, a, a, any of them that would be something that I would rather do than anything else. So I'll, we're all rather nice to have the whole point of it. Right. Well, we've come to a close. So a big round of applause for Shane. And thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for the chat.